Uh, welcome back, everybody, uh, for our very interesting second panel. Uh, I'm going to introduce, I'm David Hayes, by the way, the, uh, uh, from the State Impact Center at NYU. Uh, thank you again for uh, a terrific, uh, being a terrific audience this morning. I'm um, going to introduce Dr. Stuart Harris, who will uh, introduce his panel and, and um, uh, kick off a fascinating discussion with health experts about climate impacts. Um, Stuart is the founder and chief of the Massachusetts General Hospital Division of Wilderness Medicine and the director of Mass General's Wilderness Med Medicine Fellowship. He is a full-time attending physician uh, in the emergency department and an associate professor of emergency medicine at Harvard Medical School. He graduated from the Harvard-affiliated Emergency Medicine Residency in 2003. Stewart's research is fascinating. It focuses on investigating the pathogenesis and treatment of high altitude illness and the, on the interplay between climate change and human health. He's been conducting research uh, with the Himalayan Rescue Association in the Mount Everest region since 1999 and the U.S. Army's Research Institute for Environmental Medicine since 2004. One of my favorites uh, on his long resume is that he worked at a Denali National Park Climbing Ranger Patrol uh, where he performed the first ultrasound imaging on the summit of North America. Uh, he's a co-creator and faculty on the month-long medical student course, Medicine in the Wild with Knowles. That's the National Outdoors Leadership School. That's focused for more than 15 years on introducing young medical students to the risks and opportunities climate change poses to human health. So Stuart's an unusual cat, as you can tell. Um, let me add a couple other uh, 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 flavors to that. Prior to medical school, Stuart worked as a Knowles instructor, uh, sea kayaking in the lower 48 in Alaska. He has a black belt in judo. He was a bronze medalist in the U.S. Whitewater Open Canoe Slalom Nationals, a commercial fisherman in Alaska. And get this, he earned his master's in fine art at the Iowa Writers Workshop. Uh, in fact, his first novel in 1989 about the issue of this conference, uh, climate uh, and health. Uh, it's a novel focus that focuses on climate change and humans. So uh, as I mentioned at the outset uh, this morning, Dr. Harris was an inspiration and a driver for this entire conference. I'm happy to turn it over to him now. Thank you very, very much, David. That's an extraordinarily uh, a great gracious introduction that I won't live up to, but uh, I know my panelists will. Um, I'll be introducing everybody in greater detail, but just in brief, wanted to start off by introducing Dr. Kari Nadell uh, coming to us from Stanford, Dr. Linda Walden coming to us from her practice in Southwest Georgia, and Dr. I don't see him here. Are you? Oh, there you are. Dr. Rahm is a, a leading uh, expert in New York City, and they each bring an extraordinary insight into how climate change is already directly in, uh, impacting human health. And we'll be walking slowly through that, having brief presentations, and then to type them in and we will try to get to them. So I'll start off with Dr. Nadu and introduce her. Uh, she's one of the nation's foremost experts in adult and pediatric allergy and asthma and we're very grateful for her participation here today. She's an Adasi Foundation Endowed Professor in Medicine and Pediatrics and the director of the Sean Parker Center for Allergy and Asthma Research at Stanford University. Dr. Nadu grew up in New Jersey. She tells me on a houseboat in the middle of a polluted Mullica River where her father was acting as a research scientist. So the curiosity about the world and its impact on our health is something that has uh, long uh, and deep roots in her and that she had asthma and allergies to mold uh, she's an extraordinary product of uh, my local background here, getting her MD and her PhD from Harvard Medical School. She completed her residency here at Boston Children's Hospital 
and a clinical fellowship in asthma in immunology at Stanford and at the University of California, San Francisco. Over the last 30 years, I couldn't begin to cover the breadth of her expertise. Uh, she has over 200 peer-reviewed publications, has looked at allergies and asthma and the molecular mechanisms underlying diseases. Importantly, she has done groundbreaking work in California's Central Valley examining environmental pollutants and their impact on less advantaged communities. Unfortunately, over the last two weeks, she's been deeply immersed in some of the planet's worst air quality as climate change related wildfires have ravaged California and the West Coast and the mountain states. In the last couple of weeks in speaking with physicians across California and Washington, Oregon, in Colorado, I've been told repeatedly that they're seeing patients, healthy patients, not people even with underlying lung disease, who are flooding into emergency departments saying, I can't breathe. And when as Americans, we have wide swaths of our population saying, I can't breathe, we need to be paying attention. This is an emergency, and this is something that needs to be addressed now. I would like to ask you all to welcome Dr. Nadu, and we'll look forward to her comments. Thank you so much, Stuart. It's wonderful to be here and to give a talk. We are very excited about being able to talk about children and climate change. And this is such a critical issue for all of us. Uh, because this is our generation now and our generation to come, and we need to think about the future. So I'm very excited about being here today, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, I might be thousands of miles away, but we're all on Zoom, and I think we collectively can talk about these issues that are affecting children around the planet. So children and climate change are particularly at risk. Children are the least responsible for climate change, but they're the greatest burden of its impact. The WHO estimates that nearly 90% of the burden of disease attributable to climate change is borne by children under the age of five in both developing and developed countries. It will be difficult to overcome these challenges because nearly 20% of the world's children live in extreme poverty, which further compromises their social status and access to care. And pollution not only causes issues in children, but also the unborn. And pollution causes and has been associated with preterm births, as well as lower birth rate, as well as many premature deaths, unfortunately, about 7 million per year. And when we talk about children and poverty, we need to talk about race. We need to talk about environmental justice. And children often bear the brunt of these issues. I'd like to point out that environmental racism is nothing new. It's real. We need to be able to think about this and collectively improve this. Unfortunately, people of color are two times more likely to live without potable water and modern sanitization. 56% of the population near toxic waste sites are people of color. My colleague Nadine Harris, who's currently the California attorney excuse me, California Surgeon General, has developed a wonderful book in the ability to look at stress and calling this ACEs as a metric, adverse childhood experiences. And with that, you can see that children of color are much more likely to have a higher score, which means more stress. And as we think about global climate change and the things that are happening in their health and their environment, this is going to get even worse if we don't do something about it now. The Center for Effective Government reported in 2016 that children of color make up almost two-thirds of the 5.7 million children who live within one mile of a high-risk chemical facility in the United States. And I don't need to remind everyone about what happened in Flint, Michigan and the lead toxicity in those populations with over 50% of the population who were of color. And with that, I'd like to turn now to California. Like Stuart was saying, over the last two weeks, we've had major issues with wildfires. And this is just a graphic to show that with climate change, because there is increased temperatures, because we are much drier, because we still unfortunately are using a large majority of diesel exhaust 
and that's affecting ozone and heat and greenhouse gases. We have seen an increase in the millions of acres that have burned up and that goes up in the air and that smoke is toxic and there is no safe distance from smoke and especially for children. And I wanna point out this picture where the child is wearing one of the cloth masks that we've been told to wear for COVID, but unfortunately this does not do anything to prevent smoke inhalation. There are such fine particles in smoke and oftentimes organic compounds that even the best mask cannot prevent you from breathing in. And so we need to protect children, protect pregnant women especially. Children unfortunately are four times to six times more likely to have asthma than any other population when exposed to wildfires and only four days of wildfires with an air quality index of about 100. So it doesn't take a lot to induce new disease in a child who otherwise is healthy. I'd also like to point out that children and other underserved populations are at high risk. We need to get better at putting emergency preparedness plans together. For example, this is our Paradise Fire, which happened in 2018, where the emergency preparedness plan said to use the local hospital to go to for a clean room and to be safe, but unfortunately that was one of the first buildings that burned down during the fire. So there's hope. I wanna make sure that you hear that loud and clear today that, for example, this is a study where in children's homes, we placed HEPA filters in Fresno, California and Central Valley of California. Unfortunately, they see a lot of wildfire smokes Indeed, about one third of their year is full of smoky skies from Yosemite now. And because they live close to Yosemite, the Fresno population is at high risk for having wildfire smoke pollution on top of the already polluted skies they deal with. So we put HEPA filters in these homes. You can see that the asthma control test score, which we were using for these families, decreased over time. This is a small study, but again, HEPA filters seem to help in the homes. I'd like to move forward on air pollution caused by bus idling, for example. This was a study that was done in 2015. And importantly, again, after the EPA's National Clean Diesel Campaign required cleaner fuels to be used in buses, you can see here in the y-axis when you're looking at a decrease in the percentage of children that had asthma, that if ultra low sulfur diesel was used in the buses instead of other fuel sources, there was a 30% decrease in the rate of asthma, especially in the severe children. So again, cleaner fuel means better health in children. And for my inspiration, I was talking to Stuart about how important it is that our own stories, our own populations that we help, try to help as physicians my patients over the last two weeks have come into the office saying, I can't breathe, I'm coughing all the time, I have so much mucus. And that's because of the wildfire smoke. But what about those populations that oftentimes have to live in that degree of population continually? And they're constantly dealing with asthma, for example, in Beijing or New Delhi. In this respect, a group of teenagers came together and after seeing our studies that Stuart was mentioning on the molecular changes that were being caused, we think, by pollution and wildfire smoke. The group of teenagers came together and said, we wanna help, we wanna do something. Let's go to our local officials and try to change some of the laws around bus idling and some of the issues around global climate change. And so this is, a, I think, a great story showing that a group of teenagers, a group of citizens, just like Margaret Mead said, small group of people is needed to change the world. And this is what happened. We were able to go to the California Air Resources Board and change some of the vehicular emission standards for the local county and then moving forward in California. So we're really excited about some good news. What can we do as doctors to help children and parents? We need to spread the word. We have to have simple, clear messages. I'm so glad to join my colleagues here, Ari and others, to be able to think about what should we do in the future as physicians, as clinicians, I think as scientists, this is our civic duty to be able to pass these messages on. There's a consensus now among scientists that climate change is real. We certainly felt it here in California the last two weeks. It's bad for people, it's bad for future generations of people, and it is solvable. With that, I'd like to thank the meeting organizers and give the podium back to Stuart. Thank you so much for your attention. Excellent work, Dr. Nadu. I just am struck again by uh, just what an honor it is to be here with you. Um, our panelists have made not 
just scientific advances and medical advances, but have followed through and in changing policy, uh, giving their patients a voice in uh, working towards a better world and a safer, more healthy world. So um, thank you very much, Dr. Nadu. Part of that leadership is uh, seen very clearly in our next speaker. I think sometimes we get in a, a very dangerous place of thinking that addressing climate and fossil fuel use is a, a red state or a blue state problem. And it, it's a universal human problem. And Dr. Linda Walden uh, will be speaking next. Dr. Walden tells me her mission is reaching out to make a difference uh, in rural Southwest Georgia and across the state and nation. And from what I've seen, she's very much doing it. Uh, Dr. Walden is a native of St. Albans, New York, and grew up in Sebring, Florida, and was one of the first African Americans to integrate the public school system there. She graduated from Florida A&M University, where she was selected as one of their living legends, and graduated from the Mercer University School of Medicine before she returned to her family roots in Thomasville, Georgia, to practice medicine. Dr. Walden is a visionary. She's a pioneer. She's a catalyst and a community advocate. She has mentored youth to enter the medical field and is a motivational speaker who has broken several color barriers and received numerous honors and awards from local, state, and local authorities. A very small selection of these honors include being named Most Outstanding Rural Practice in Georgia by the Georgia Rural Health Association. She has received the Martin Luther King Jr. Drum Major for Justice and Peace Award, the National Thomas Jefferson Award for her outstanding community service. She's been named by the National Medical Association a Physician of the Year. She's been inducted into the Southern Rural Black Women's Hall of Fame for Economic and Social Justice, is a past president of the Georgia State Medical Association, and is a founder and past president of the Grady County Habitat for Humanity. Dr. Walden was the first African-American chief of staff at the Grady General Hospital in Cairo, Georgia, and the first female physician, either black or white, to establish a private medical practice in Georgia. She's a founding and a steering committee member for the Georgia Clinicians for Climate Change Action, a member of the Medical Society Consortium for Climate and Health. A little known fact is that her cousin was Jackie Robinson, the famous baseball pioneer. She's a member of the Bethel AME Church. And draws deep inspiration from her faith. If you get a chance, listen, you can Google her, and she has a remarkable voice. Uh, she, she's a gospel singer, and uh, her voice is one the nation desperately needs. Dr. Walden, please. Thank you so much, uh, Stuart. I, I really appreciate it. It's certainly an honor and a privilege and a joy to be a part of this panel on a topic that is definitely um, in need of, of attention to this nation in order for all of us to have better opportunities and better health. And we've got to clean up our climate. We've got to clean up our nation. We've got to clean it out. There's so much that's been going on, especially now because of climate change. Health is the human face of climate change. And it truly is a public health crisis. And not enough attention is being brought to it. But now with COVID-19, also with the police brutalities and murders of Blacks, the time has come for a transformational change in this nation to address the health care inequities, the disparities, and the systemic racism that affects us on all levels, all socioeconomic levels, not just health, but our, our workplace, our schools, our kids are suffering. We've got to do more. 
and we've got to make a difference in this country. And that's what I'm trying to do. So as I talk about climate change and public health next, what I wanna talk about is letting you know, next slide please, is that climate change is all about global warming. And as you see there, higher ground ozone layers, there are two types of ozone. There's the good ozone and the bad ozone. The good ozone is the stratospheric ozone that's much higher up that helps to protect us from the sun rays. Uh, however, the ground ozone is kind of what you would look at as, as small uh, fog and the smog in the higher, the big cities and, and what you see with all the smoke from the wildfires. That's ground ozone that is the worst. That is what's harmful. That is what's killing so many people. Over 250,000 people die every year from climate change in America and over 5 million worldwide. And it's causing the heat waves, the hurricanes, rainfall, storms, wildfires, and it worsens the medical problems that we already are dealing with, so many of our, our patients. Hypertension and diabetes, asthma, COPD, sickle cell crisis, and added stress. And you know, stress is very common for all of us that we see in our practices. It's about 70, 80% of the visits that come to our practice are dealing with some type of stress. And we want to see what we can do to make a difference, to improve all of this. Unfortunately, we we're dealing with the healthcare disparities and health inequities that affect blacks five times more than whites now combined with COVID-19, which is killing the majority of Blacks in this country. As you, as someone mentioned earlier, there are over 200,000 deaths in the United States and over 6 million people have, have, have been tested. You know, so we have got to do more and we've got to do it now. It cannot wait. This is urgent. A common cold in whites is pneumonia in Blacks. That should not be happening in America. Why? Because many of these Blacks are essential workers. Yes, essential workers are healthcare providers, the doctors and nurses, but I'm talking about essential workers that put food on our tables, the ones that are stocking our shelves with groceries, the ones that are working out on the farms and agriculture, the ones that are working in meat factories and processing them, making sure we have food to eat, the ones who are delivering the packages. And guess what? These essential workers, they don't get paid sick leave, many of them. They don't have uh, health care insurance, many of them. Why? Because they can't afford it. And that should not be happening in America. This is one of the richest countries in the world, but yet, not health-wise, we rank number 38. So racial and health injustices must, must stop because yes, I do believe Black Lives Matters. And when Black Lives Matters, then we can say, all lives matter. But until we have these, these, in, these discrepancies, these disproportionate ratios of Blacks and people of color being mostly affected with all of these issues and problems that are going on today, being killed, um, having these diseases, dying, it is not going to be the same. We have got to make it matter. We have got to do our part. And America, as I mentioned, is the twelfth is is one of the top twelve wealthiest um, nations, but not the health, but not the healthiest nation. So if we got so much money, then why not we need to do more? Next slide, please. Climate change impacts our social determinants of health, and that's where we live, where we go to school, the type of education we get where we worship, and where we age. Most of our people live in poverty. Many Blacks receive unequal pay, lower income for the same job that whites do, but yet they may get ten dollars and $20,000 less. Even on the educational level, they may have the same educational level, but the, 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 the pay is not level. They don't get the same. They may have a bachelor's and you have a bachelor's and they're still gonna, you're still gonna get as an African-American 10 to $20,000 less. Essential workers, as I mentioned before, those who are 
keeping us alive, putting food on our tables, they can't telecommute. They can't work from home when they got to put things on the shelves and deliver items to us. And that's why they don't have the insurance. They suffer more as a result. And as a result of suffering, they don't live as long as whites. So we have got to do better in this country. Climate change impacts us because of all the fossil fuels from our driving our cars, the carbon dioxide, the methane, the nitrous oxide, the sulfur oxide, all of that's in the air and it's killing us. The power plants, the wildfires, affecting the air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat, and the weather we experience. Next slide. This must stop. As we talk about air pollution and climate change, you have to put it in, in combination with COVID-19 because that's what we're dealing with now, both. And this is truly going to cause more lives in this country. Now with flu season starting. So please people, get your flu shots. Wear your mask, social distance. Do what you can to protect yourself so that you can keep your loved ones from getting any type of the disease such as the COVID-19 to keep from being hospitalized and dying. The problem we have in America, in addition to the systemic racism, is health inequity. Inequity. Now, health equity is when everybody has a fair chance to live and be, and, and be as healthy as possible. But we don't have that in America. That's why so many Blacks are dying. It's due to systemic racism, as I mentioned before. Health disparities are the higher burden of illness that people experience, one group of people compared to another. So if you don't have the opportunity to be as healthy as possible, guess what? You're gonna be the person who's gonna suffer more than others with diseases and thus the health disparities. And that's how health inequities lead to health disparities. So we've got to do more. We have got to do more to resolve the injustices because black lives still matter. And until black lives matter, all lives will not matter. Next slide. We must right the wrongs for the people of color. We need to establish universal health care for everyone. So please, as I mentioned, we've got a clean house. And the first house we need to start with is the White House. So everybody must vote. We've got to mentor our black young, our youth to become black physicians. Do you realize that there are over 900,000 physicians in this country and only 516,000 are white and only 45,000 are black? And of those black, there are less than half are men. We've got more black women becoming doctors, but the black men are falling by the wayside. We've got to do better. We have got to mentor our youth to go into medicine. We've got to open those doors and give them the opportunities to become a physician. And we've got to start right now. To improve our communities, we need to increase the better health by advertising things that are going to improve our health, the billboards, the TV commercials, things that we need to do to decrease the spread of COVID. We have to have safe parks and walking trails for exercise. We don't have that in many of our Black communities because people are too afraid to go out because of the crime. We need equal pay for equal jobs and, and sick leave for everybody. Promote jobs and everybody still, please, you need to get tested. Too many people are asymptomatic walking around here, spreading it to others. We need to contact our elected officials and national, on national, local and state levels to erect new laws and policies for clean energy, decrease emissions, and access to health care for all. Because all of us must become a part of the solution or we are part of the problem. And as I mentioned before to someone just a week ago in talking, if we are not at the table, people, we will be on the menu. So we got to get busy. Next slide. Solutions for our clean air and energy, what we can do Decrease the fossil fuel emissions, which is what's happening now with COVID-19. We don't fly as much and travel as much. Reduce your errands maybe to twice a week because the more gas you burn out there, the more fossil fuels you're putting out there. Maybe consider the next car you buy an electric car. 
that'll certainly help a lot in cleaning up our environment. For the cars you do have, get those maintenance checks on those cars, change those oil filters and air filters, get your tires checked because you see when they're not working right and they're all plugged up with dust and dirt, it's just making you burn more gas. Make sure your home is well insulated, get those AC vents cleaned out, consider buying solar panels. In some states, it's a, it's a tax uh, write-off. You can, you can get credits on that. They are expensive from five to $12,000 in some areas. We must end poverty. To be one of the wealthiest nations in the world, we should not have this issue. There should be no poverty. We've got to provide training jobs and health insurance for people who have served their prison time and stop penalizing them because they were in prison when they served their time and paid their fine. Help them get back into the workforce. That's why you see them coming back into prison. Nobody's helping them. They can help clean up this environment. So give them jobs. Walk instead of driving all the time. Buy your LED and energy efficient appliances. That will help save energy. Unplug devices you're not using at home. Use power strips or surrogate um, strips to, uh, to keep from having short circuits when there's lightning and thunderstorms. Get green plants put in your household, indoor plants. They help clean up the air and believe it or not, they convert some of that CO2 to O2. Have your air and water tested. All you have to do is just call your local environmental protection agency. If you don't know, you can Google it or you can call this national number and they will give you the number locally and it will tell you your regional office. See what your air quality is. Know that. Know what's going on in your community. And if you see there are problems that look like it's, come, it's air pollution or our uh, bad water, um, call the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. We've got to eliminate the health disparities and bring about health equity for all Americans. Clean air and clean energy. We've got to be responsible to make this happen. Inequality in health is a result of racism and inequality in wealth and climate justice. It won't happen without racial justice. Next slide. And lastly, as I close, please make sure you've completed your 2020 census. Many people don't realize how much money can come into your community. If you just complete that and turn it in, it will help improve your neighborhoods, your roads, um, your hospitals, your schools. It does a lot for your community, but if you all don't fill it out, it's less money coming to your community. Be sure you vote because your vote is your voice. We've got to unite black, white, brown, yellow, we have got to come together in this United States of America to make it better. It will not happen with one. It will take all of us. It will take all of us. What affects one of us will affect all of us. So don't just stand on the side. Don't just be a part of the village. Get involved in the village. Let's do our part to unite for a healthier and better America for all generations to come. And let us continue to pray Pray for our nation and trust in God because our lives are dependent on him. God bless you and thank you. Dr. Walden, I, uh, <laughs> how one follows that, I, I don't uh, know, but my heart is with you. Thank you. Thank you. Our, our next speaker is Dr. William Rom, Bill Rom, and Bill's been an extraordinary figure contributing to the intersection of climate change and environmental pollutions and health uh, for a long time. He was the Saul, or is the Saul and Judith Bergstein Professor of Medicine Emeritus and in Environmental Medicine at the NYU School of Medicine. He's the former director of the NYU Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care for a quarter century and former chief of the Bellevue Chest Service where he trained dozens of pulmonary and critical care fellows and occupational medicine residents and postdoctoral researchers. Interestingly, Dr. Rahm started, as many great physician leaders do, as a wilderness canoe guide from the boundary waters of Minnesota. His dad was uh, similarly gifted 
Bill went on to chair the first symposium on the Boundary Waters Canoe Area on Earth Day in 1970 at the University of Minnesota. In training, he was a fellow of Irving Selikoff, MD, at Mount Sinai, who is largely regarded as the father of environmental medicine. He went on to get his master's in public health at the Harvard School of Public Health and was named their Distinguished Alumni Award in 2011. In his work, he founded and directed the Rocky Mountain Center for Occupational and Environmental Health at the University of Utah and served as the editor-in-chief of the highly respected textbook, Environmental and Occupational Medicine. As a leading clinician at New York City's Bellevue Hospital, Dr. Rahm cared for patients with HIV and AIDS, tuberculosis, and occupational and environmental related diseases, including the deadly effects caused by dust toxicity after 9-11. Dr. Rahm helped lead the NYU Medical Center response to the climate emergency of Hurricane Sandy, where the tremendous fragility of our healthcare infrastructure to sea level rise was made absolutely clear. He's the author of National Policy and Law and teaches climate change and environmental health at the NYU School of, the Glo of Global Public Health. Uh, if he ever challenges you to a ski race, don't take him up on it. He uh, still races in the Aspen town, town races, and it's a tremendous pleasure to welcome Dr. Rahm to our panel. Well, thank you very much, Stu. I'm going to share the screen and try to bring up some slides. I'm going to address three areas in my few minutes. Uh, they have high attribution to global warming, their uh, heat, air pollution, and extreme weather. Uh, from the National Weather Service, we now have extreme heat as well as flooding and tornadoes and hurricanes as the leading cause of death. Uh, secondly, you can see that uh, the days per year that are hotter, for example, above 95 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, looking uh, at the next two decades, there are areas across the globe that are going to get hotter. Third, uh, you can look at heat from the standpoint of heat waves. The most famous one was in August 2003 in France. The mean and maximum temperature exceeded the norm by 11 to 12 degrees centigrade in nine consecutive days, leading to 15,000 excess deaths in France and 32,000 in Western Europe with 70,000 uh, total across the uh, European continent. The increase in deaths were related to heat stroke, hyperthermia and dehydration, uh, chronic respiratory disease and stroke. Uh, when I was an intern in July of 1971, uh, I was assigned to the emergency room. In my second week of internship, a mid-aged white male came in, uh, uptunded, and the nurse took his temperature and it was 107 degrees Fahrenheit. This was my first case of hyperthermia. We dumped ice cubes on him, started an IV and tried to resuscitate him, but he died. Uh, I was exposed to that ex ex uh, event in the extreme heat of Sacramento and Central Valley, California, and it uh, made a lasting impression. Uh, fourth, uh, there's something called an urban heat island uh, over uh, cities, it's hotter because of the impervious surfaces. And if you move forward uh, under higher emissions, the whole country is going to be experiencing increased surface air temperature. As John Holdren mentioned, if you factor in humidity and look at the wet bulb global temperature uh, uh, exceeding 33 degrees centigrade, which is thought to be the level of safety, uh, we already have uh, more than uh, 250 million people across the globe exposed uh, to this level at one degree uh, centigrade increase. If we go to 1.5 degrees centigrade from global warming, that 250 is gonna double to 508 million people. If we go to two degrees centigrade, which we may well do by 2060, we'll have 789 million people exposed to this WB 
uh, GT temperature above 33 degrees centigrade. If we hit three degrees centigrade, which we very likely will do by the end of this century, 1.22 billion people will be exposed to this severe heat more than one day per year. Well, heat isn't equal to everybody. This is from Jeremy Hoffman at the Museum of Science in uh, Richmond, Virginia, published in the famous New York Times on August 24th, that Richmond has areas that have greater heat than other. And you can see on this slide, that the uh, right-hand side is bright red for high heat, and the blue is uh, cooler. And if you look on the right-hand side of the slide, you'll see that the areas that have red high heat are also shaded in red. This is from the redlining map in the 1930s after the Fair Housing Act was passed, and government bureaucrats outlined areas of low income in red. The, the mean income there was between $250 and $750 a year, and in yellow are similar declining neighborhoods, and blue are up and coming neighborhoods, and the green were good neighborhoods with an uh, income of 7,500 per year back in 1937. So they wanted to guarantee mortgages under this act, and they looked at the red, and that was 95% black. They looked at the green, that was 95% white, and this has persisted. Uh, and caused uh, systemic racism for almost the whole century. If you look at the further maps, uh, the redlined areas had fewer trees, there's less green in this area, and on the bottom right, uh, there's more dark areas suggesting parking lots and impervious surfaces. So this has created uh, uh, racial disparities. Those disparities are not only in uh, heat, but they're also in air pollution. So this is a slide looking at PM 2.5, which we've already heard about. And in the United States, the average concentration of PM 2.5 is higher, where it's red and yellow on the eastern half of the country, and also in California uh, in the far west. In the upper right, you can see that PM 2.5 has been declining since 1981, uh, every single year except 2018, which went up 5%. On the lower left, uh, with the arrow, you can see some of the racial disparities. This is from a study published uh, July 31st in Science by Colmer. Uh, you can see that there is a line of identity and all these dots with the x-axis 1981 PM 2.5 and the y-axis uh, 2016 PM 2.5. And you can see that these are 65,000 census tracts looking at PM 2.5. If you're in uh, a very clean census tract in 1981 with very little pollution, uh, you're still in that same census tract in 1981 with very little pollution. If you're in uh, the census tract that is the most polluted, in 1981, you're still in that same census tract that's most polluted in uh, 2016. So we have gone very, uh, not very far in 36 years. In the middle figure, you can see the uh, change in the pollution in these census tracts. And in the dirtiest one, they actually had the greatest uh, actual decline in PMT 2.5. So that's good news. But the bad news is that the relative ranking of those 100 uh, uh, census tracts, the dirtiest one has persisted to be the dirtiest one uh, in 36 years. On the right is data from Dye in the New England Journal published in 2017 about mortality from 22 million uh, Medicare deaths between 2000 and 2012, looking at uh, PM 2.5 uh, by uh, uh, areas of residence, and you can see that there's a very steep curve uh, in the hazard ratio uh, for mortality from cardiopulmonary disease and exposure to PM 2.5. As points of reference here at 15 uh, micrograms uh, per meter cubed of PM 2.5, that's the standard under uh, the George W. Bush uh, EPA, uh, they didn't lower that, uh, even though I lobbied uh, the EPA administrator as part of the American Thoracic Society to try to lower it. 
Uh, but under President Obama, he did lower this uh, annual mean standard to 12. So you can see 12 is safer than 15, but it's still a, a long ways from being safe. The WHO recommends 10. And more recently, under the last five-year review of the NACs or the National Ambient Air Quality Standards between 10 and 8, uh, there was no change uh, from uh, that standard. Lastly, I'm going to talk about uh, extreme weather. Uh, this is Hurricane Sandy and NYU, uh, where we all are faculty. On the left is uh, Tisch Hospital being evacuated on the night of uh, Monday when the hurricane struck with a 13 and a half foot tidal surge that uh, inundated the Bellevue uh, basement. Here's the water coming into Bellevue. The basement is where the elevators uh, went and they were shorted out. The pumps for the diesel to keep the lights on was shorted out and brigades were formed by doctors to bring diesel up to the 13th floor and the pumps for water to bring water up to the 22nd floor to uh, flush a thousand uh, toilets was wiped out. So the hospital had to be evacuated two days later. Uh, as head of a training program, all of a sudden I had uh, my two main hospitals with no patients to train my doctors. I had no place for my doctors to see their clinic patients. And we had to meet, uh, we had no place to meet. So we met in local bars and we developed programs at other hospitals. Uh, for our trainees, and we developed uh, off-site uh, clinics to see our patients. Uh, we had to close down all our laboratories. All the transgenic mice at NYU were in the basement. They were all drowned. Uh, NYU lost a billion dollars and was rewarded that from FEMA. Uh, Bellevue, 350 million to change its electrical system. So we were out of sync for six months. This was uh, extremely uh, stressful to everybody. Uh, I ended up uh, having uh, a cellulitis of a leg that caused me to limp, so I went to the orthopedist and he gave me some antibiotics. Uh, a week later, I went back to him and said, what are these little red dots all over my skin? He says, you have, uh, lo looks like herpes zoster from your stress. So I went to the dermatologist. He said, yes, you have disseminated zoster. Get the hell out of here. Go home, take a, take a cyclovir. Uh, so I responded to the doctor. So these things uh, uh, cause stress. So I was a climate patient myself. I'll end with uh, one sentence about fires. Uh, this is the Wettstein uh, paper uh, in 2018 uh, that looked at the wildfire smoke in California. They had eight uh, smoke sheds, uh, smoke, uh, uh, smoky sheds that they looked at and they got data on emergency room visits by zip code in those eight, uh, uh, fire sheds and compared them from September to uh, from May to September in 2015 and found significantly increased emergency room visits for ischemic heart disease, dysrhythmia, heart failure, pulmonary embolism, stroke, and respiratory conditions on the day of the smoke or even one day later. And they compared this to acute uh, appendicitis and especially uh, individuals more than 65 years were susceptible to this smoke. Uh, and on the bottom right is uh, that smoke reaching Washington, D.C. and causing haze over the Washington Monument. So thank you. Beautiful. Thank you very much, Dr. Rahm. I think it's worth everybody's listening just to, to make sure we hear loud and clear. Both Dr. Nadu and Dr. Rahm now have spoken to uh, how climate change uh, can suddenly remove healthcare facilities so we can think we have uh, access to hospitals and that we've built robust systems, but if suddenly climate change can render those unavailable, um, the best technology in the world is lost and um, it, it's kind of a scary time. So with less felicity probably than uh, many of our Panelist, I will try to run through my slides. So I'll be speaking to climate change as the healthcare emergency it is. So I'm an attending physician at Massachusetts General Hospital. My daily practice, which included the weekend and recent overnights, is the ability to recognize emergencies, which are circumstances that call for immediate action. A common 
uh, plight may be, I, I can't breathe. And that's um, one that kind of gets our attention and as citizens should certainly get our attention. The scientific data have been very clear for a long time, uh, at least 30 years, that climate is warming and that it's due to human influence. You can see Dr. Hansen there giving his testimony in the summer of 1988. Um, it, it was quite compelling then to the point that I, again, focused my narrative limited abilities on uh, trying to understand just why we didn't seem to be able to move forward and away from a fossil fuel based economy. The medical data are equally clear as have been very well uh, discussed by our other panelists. Um, there's obvious heat stress injuries, there's cardiovascular disease. Uh, the independent use of fossil fuels directly increases uh, rates of disability and disease and death by asthma, by strokes, by heart attacks. And lastly, it's become quite clear that the least affluent of our patients who have contributed the least to climate change are being most negatively impacted by it. So climate justice uh, is very, very real. And that health, sorry, that climate change rather is very clearly a healthcare emergency my patients now are being impacted by climate change and fossil fuel use, and that it is time for action now. 30, 40 years ago, we had a little room um, and we could think about <laughs> writing stories. Now it's time to act. Um, and we need to get to a, a world and a country where we don't have large portions of our population saying, I can't breathe. I'm sometimes asked what the role of healthcare providers is in climate change. And I think we have obvious, unique uh, scientific and medical expertise. And that's something I think we depend on and maybe do a little bit less good a job at using it uh, outside the hospital than we could. I think a special power that healthcare providers have that they don't recognize is that we are a story-driven profession. If I could be given just one tool to help my patients to make a diagnosis, it's to have them talk to me, to have us be able to communicate and to understand what's going on. It's really the gold standard for deciding what other medical tests we might need to send to uh, make a diagnosis. And we're expert communicators. Every day, healthcare workers communicate very complex scientific data to their patient in ways that they can understand and in ways that the patients are in turn motivated to improve their health. And this is a rare quality. I have extraordinary colleagues who are PhDs um, who know the data left and right, um, but it's that communicating the data, giving voice to the data, that's uh, a unique ability of healthcare providers to uh, forward that progress. Part of it is forwarded by the fact that we're a trusted source of climate change and health data. The public and voters trust us and with good reason. We've given our lives over uh, to acting in their best interests and uh, that's reflected uh, in their trust. Another point that I think is absolutely critical is that healthcare is both deeply personal, but it's also universal. And using the lens of healthcare makes what can seem distant, maybe DC-based policy decisions, absolutely real to people and visceral. And using our patients' stories and making sure that the experiences of our patients are known to policymakers can make very clear that energy policies can be either life-given if they're low carbon sourced or potentially life-threatening if they're fossil fuel based sources. Another way that health I think is vastly underrated is in it's an extraordinarily effective fulcrum for rapid policy change. If you would have told me a year ago um, that the very well established and legacy policies um, would be as upended as they were by a simple virus, I think I would have looked a little askance at you. And here we're uh, altering the basic mechanism, the biosphere upon which all life depends. 
Um, and so to not see that as a way to rapidly change established systems, as I think we've proven differently. So in closing, I think the prescription for change is pretty simple and it's been spoken to by each of our panelists uh, much more eloquently than I, but for health providers and for policy, public policy makers and for the voting public to know that climate change is a healthcare emergency. We had time to act in a graded fashion in the past. It's time to step up our game and to act now. I think as Dr. Bernstein and others have made clear uh, in the Attorney General, uh, Dr. <laughs> Attorney General Healy made clear, um, climate change policy is healthcare policy. As physicians, this is our responsibility. And our patient stories matter tremendously to informing policymakers and leaders that this is something that needs to be dealt with right now. As healthcare providers, we have uh, a tremendous uh, influence, and I think it's absolutely critical that we use it and that we advocate for a low carbon economy uh, in an apolitical manner. I don't see this as being political at all. This is just good health policy. It's prudent, it's just, it's fiscally efficient, and it's life saving. And the changes that we can make towards moving towards a low carbon economy are uh, long overdue and what we should be acting on. I think we've been enthusiastic enough. I don't know that we have a great deal of time for a conversation, but I would love if, uh, since we heard from her last, if we can start with Dr. Nadu, to just tell a very brief story about how climate change has impacted one of your patients. Yeah, oh, well, thank you. I um, recently took care of a young girl who was five uh, who came into our emergency room and she had never had any wheezing or asthma before uh, but unfortunately she had been um, exposed to wildfire smoke um, not up close but this is hundreds of miles away and here in the Stanford area we've been exposed all of us and children I knew had a six times higher rate of getting asthma de novo uh, when it comes to wildfire smoke exposure. So it had been about four days of our heavy skies, our orange skies, which you all saw on the news. And she was one of many children that were coming into the emergency room with asthma. And so she couldn't breathe. She, um, her parents were extremely worried about her and they asked, why is it that she's getting this and not us and that's because unfortunately children are at a much higher risk and the other issue is that a lot of the N95 masks are not specifically made for children's mouths yet and so we need better ways to um, mitigate and adapt to wildfires especially in children. She uh, did get better um, thank goodness but we had to work very hard to get her out of status as medicus. Um, and that was sad to see, but she was one of many. I think my other story is an elderly uh, man who's 65, otherwise completely healthy, runs all the time, works out, didn't work out during the wildfires, but then had a stroke. And when his wife asked, you know, why uh, did he have a stroke? Um, it, it pains me to say that because the pollution gets right into your bloodstream, and people who are elderly already have a higher rate of having um, blood clotting issues, especially stroke. And so for him, he had no other risk factors except the fact that he was exposed to wildfire smoke for five days in a row, um, despite having all the appropriate filters in his home and despite wearing a mask outside. So these things are really worrisome to me as a physician and we need to act on these things and to help the planet get better so our patients can get better. Thank you very much, Dr. Nadu. In uh, deference and respect to uh, the people we have uh, on the line, I want to end in a timely fashion. Um, we'll look forward to future occasions where we can hear more from Dr. Walden and Ram and Nadu. Um, they're important leaders in bringing this forward. Uh, I, I want to thank each of them for their tremendous uh, dedication and for their willingness to step in and, and to help protect their patients. Uh, with this, uh, we'll conclude the conference. I want to be sure to thank Melissa and David and Ricky 
uh, their extraordinary staff, our panelists, both in the first and the second panel, and the attention of, Doc, of Attorney General Healy. I seem to want to make her a physician. Um, I want to thank our audience uh, who have joined us and are taking this fight forward, and I hope doing it with the same spirit that Dr. Naidu spoke to of hopefulness, that this is inevitability. This is going to change, and we're going to do it together. We'll be emailing you a link of a recording of the event shortly, and I think the future is going to look back at us in 2020 and be shocked at how we allowed delay to continue. And I think they'll be pleased to know that now we've recognized that it is time for action, that climate change is a health emergency, that climate policy is health policy, and that we are well overdue in our transition to a low carbon economy, if only for the patient's health. It's our responsibility to our current patients, and to future generations, um, and we're going to see it through. Uh, thank you very much. Take care.